Thank you very much. You know, when we start off looking around the world, it's so easy to feel overwhelmed by the magnitude of this problem. We could spend the whole evening listing and discuss, discussing the manifestations of violence against women, physical, sexual, in the context of war, trafficking, and on and on and on. It would, it all, it would all be true. But there's another truth that I think it's really important that we also hang on to. And that is, in a sense, we're not here tonight because of this problem of violence against women. I actually believe we're here together because we collectively are in the process of ending this problem of men's violence against women. And so I think that our starting point, in a sense, isn't just the problem, but the fact that around the world there are movements led by women to bring this problem to an end. Now, the, the problem from, the, from, from my point of view, one problem from my point of view, has been that women have had to stand alone. And in a sense, we've left out a key word. You know, often we'll, re, we'll use the shorthand, violence against women. And in doing that, we're leaving out the key adjective, which is who's committing that violence. And of course, it's being committed by men. It's men's violence against women. It's not all men. In fact, it's not most men in most countries. It is a significant minority of men. But if we leave out that word, then we continue to define it only as a women's issue. It gets men off the hook. Not just the men who commit the violence, but those millions and millions and millions of others who have stood in silence. Now, that, that would be a problem for any group, for any half of the population to stand in silence. But the problem is when the half, that half it has disproportionate social power. When the half who has been silent controls our parliaments, makes the laws, enforces the laws, or the judges and the police, control our religious institutions, control our media, and so forth. If that half has been silent, then we are allowing the violence to continue. Women have stood alone for too long. Women in many countries have risked their lives to work to end violence against women. And finally, in countries around the world, we see men ending their silence. So what, what led to the formation of the White Ribbon Campaign 19 years ago now was a couple friends, their, their, their spouses, their partners, uh, said to them, okay, you guys, you know, you're, not, you're not using violence, but why are you silent? And they approached me and came up with this idea for a campaign, not just for a few men to speak out, but really to try to develop a vehicle for men in our millions to raise our voices, to end our silence, to think about our own attitudes, our own behavior, but also to challenge the men and boys around us. Uh, I can talk more a bit later about some of, the, some of the characters of that campaign, but the spirit really is, is one of that women should not be standing alone, that men have got to raise our voices. Uh, and the good news, I think, is that if we look back, uh, if we look back 30 years ago, where, when these issues weren't even discussed uh, in, in, in the media in, in most countries. Uh, if we look back 30 years ago, and few countries had laws around violence against women. If we look back 20 years ago, whatever, and when there were laws, they weren't implemented. Uh, we look back and there were very few shelters uh, in most countries for women to go to to escape abusive relationships. There was nothing in the way of efforts to reach out to men. Um, I think we were making incredible progress led by women and now joined by more and more men. So even though we're here you know, to discuss an incredibly heavy topic, uh, even though we're here to, to you know, it, 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 it's, it's the worst. And yet I think that what I would hope is that tonight we can carry through it a, a spirit of, of hope and possibility. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. Before we leave you, mm -hmm. though, I, I'm really interested to know... I thought I'd get off the hook that... No, no, no not no, no. yet. I just, okay. I'm really interested um, to know why you're involved in this mm -hmm. personally. What, what is it about yeah. you? Why, why Michael Kaufman? Yeah. Um, I think it came out of different things. Um, it, it came out of growing up in a family where uh, my parents were strong believers in equality. Uh, I have four sisters. And uh, I, grew up, um, I grew up without any knowledge that such a thing could be happening in the world. I have a loving and gentle... And, dad and 
strong and loving, gentle, had a strong, gentle, loving mother. And so it just, it was beyond my imagination that people could, uh, that, that, that such a thing existed. Uh, brought up with strong uh, beliefs in equality. Um, and actually for me, so I think for me, some of the transformational things was when I was a kid uh, living down in the southern U.S., uh, in the early 60s, um, at the, near the beginning of the civil rights movement. And uh, in the case of my family, when we moved down there, my parents said, um, uh, you know, we're not going to go eat in any restaurants. We, everything was segregated, different for, for whites and blacks. And they said, we're not going to go to those restaurants. Michael, you're not, you don't get to go to movies with your friends. And as a little kid, 12 years old, it feels like a bit of a rip-off at first. Why don't I get to do these things when my friends get to? And my parents were really clear. They said, as long as some people don't get to do those things, whether it's go to a movie or eat in a restaurant, um, then you shouldn't either. And so I, for me, I was raised with a value that uh, as an individual, I have to speak out um, if, I, if, I, if I see injustice. And so like many in Canada, uh, our, our lives were turned around uh, by the murder of 14 women uh, in 1989, uh, 14 students by a man who hated women, hated feminism and murdered women and really launched uh, uh, a, a moment that launched a national debate in Canada uh, about violence against women. Uh, and uh, finally, some of us realized we, we, we better start doing something. We better start speaking out. Good for you. Thank you. You know, can I just interrupt? Yeah, sure. And I, and I appreciate the genuineness uh, of, of what you just said. Good for you. But no, really, yeah. I was sincere. And, and I, I did mean good for you. No, I know. <laughs> but, but you know, but what, what I, I do want to say, and I, not to embarrass you for saying that, because I, I appreciate it and all that, but you know what? I, I think the, the um, you know, I think our attitude should be towards men, well, what took you guys so long? Um, you know, it's like, yeah, gr great you're doing this, um, but, but not to lose sight that the, the real pioneers of this work have been, have been women. But that much said, thank you. <laughs> Thanks for that. That's great. Panya, you'd have your own unique perspectives on all this. What do you see as the important issues? Um, we have been working with the community people in the rural area in Cambodia, especially uh, with women from the poor family for more than 20 years. And we hear uh, almost every day the issue of domestic violence, sexual rape, uh, from the women as well as the young girl. And they face many difficulty, like uh, one, as you mentioned. We do not have a really uh, enough safe place or assistance service available for these people who need support. And we see that violence against women is also happening in, uh, like, both in the less development country and also as well as uh, the like more developed country as yours. Um, and we also see that it's not just our responsibility as a women to work with women to stop violence. It's important we as the women and also the men to work together and uh, take responsibility to c contribute to this, uh, like to address the violence against women because it's not just about the family matter, it's about our society. So we see that it's important for everyone to share your responsibility to talk about violence against women. And I see this opportunity is a great one for us to discuss. And especially from me, from another part of the world, to be here, to hear your experience and to share our experience as well. Panya, I think you're right. I think it is a universal issue. It's, it's in every country. Tell us about some examples of, of your own experiences, though. Um, the experience, like uh, the story that we hear from the women, often is about um, like the conflict in the family, especially for the women. Like, just start from the small stuff, like. Even uh, the, the wife could not cook the good food for the husband. The husband just throw everything out of the house with the wife, seriously. And also the other issue like uh, the brother or the, the father raped the young girls in the house. It's also another issue that we face. And often this issue led to the negative impact 
to the livelihood situation in the family as well as the educa poor education for the children. We'll come back and talk a little bit more about the education of the children later because I think that's a really important, a really important point and maybe it's the starting point, but we'll hear more about that in a little while. But let's throw to Andrew now and get his perspective. I mean, I, I imagine your perspective is even different. Well, I suppose the issue for us is always around the workplace and for uh, my union and I think for many other unions, the, uh, the issue of violence in, in the workplace uh, is, is a specific one. Uh, I'm of the view that uh, violence is done to women um, in the workplace, not just by the a physical act of aggression, but also by harassment and bullying. Uh, harassment and bullying is unfortunately rife in Australian workplaces. Uh, over 24% of women say that they have been harassed or bullied in the workplace, and that can be uh, that, that can be verbal, and it can go up to <coughs> and including and include uh, rape, uh, which has unfortunately occurred. Um, for my union, we've learnt by bitter experience, both uh, in, in the workplace but also internally, uh, that we need to have very strong policies and, more importantly, actions to ensure that uh, women are protected in the workplace. Um, we developed our own internal policy uh, as a result of, about 20 years ago, um, <coughs> one official, uh, a female official of the union um, being uh, assaulted by a male official of the union. Um, we did not have, at the time, a strong policy. Uh, of course, we, uh, we always profess equality. We, we, always, uh, say, we always say and have said for many years, uh, utilising the language that's been current for about 20 years, but for longer than that, uh, that harassment and bullying is unacceptable. But when it came to actually doing something about it in the workplace, in fact, in our own workplace, uh, we just did not know how to deal with it. Um, the result of that, uh, of, that, uh, of that assault was after many court cases uh, that the perpetrator was finally, uh, was finally uh, sacked and expelled from the union. But uh, we, had to, we had to do that through, uh, through basically uh, trial and error and those errors were made by a union which, as I said, holds itself out as a beacon of equality and one which professes equality in the workplace, in the community and in, and in the nation. And so we've had to learn by bitter experience that those sort of things can't just be uh, dealt with by slogans. We do have a slogan which I think is important um, in terms of violence against women and that is an injury to one is an injury to all. Uh, in my view, an injury to one, uh, one woman, is, is an injury to all people, uh, all workers at the very least, because what we have is an inability, I think, to conceptualise that injury. Um, as I say, you injure somebody, you do violence to somebody by bullying and harassing them. Harassing them. You don't actually have uh, to have to physically touch them or um, make them, uh, you know, put, the, put them in, in, in uh, fear of, of, a, of a physical act for that to, for that to, to in, 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 encompass violence. And it's my view, and, and, and I've got to say proudly, uh, after that extreme uh, trial and error, um, that uh, it is also the view of my union that, you, that it is simply unacceptable for workers or employers to perpetrate violence in any form against, uh, against workers and especially against women workers because, as I say, uh, we've got to have the view that an injury to one is an injury to all.